Hello, how's everybody doing? Hoping you're having a fantastic day. So uh, this is the start of a new series. I've been thinking about doing this series uh, for a very long time, probably for the last six to nine months, because in my preparation for my debate with Ubi Petrus, I drew a lot from Patavius. And I found Patavius and then uh, Franzlin. Uh, Franzlin was a lot later, but there was a lot more material for Franzlin to work with. I found those two to be really the best when it came to the Filioque. And I thought if these could just be accessible to people uh, in some sort of video format, whether it be a long, long, long video, or it just be a series of videos, I think this would help a lot of people out. So, you know, I just decided that I should probably do that. So, um, this is what this is. This is going to take a really long time, um, months and months and months. So, uh, sorry if my upload speed increases or decreases, uh, but it shouldn't drop below like uh, a video every other week. And I am in the middle of two other series right now. Um, so I kind of, um, kind of for my midweek series streams, I kind of just go back and forth, whatever I feel like. Uh, preparing that week. So uh, this is going to be a bit more, a bit more chill, but this is going to be my main focus for sure. So um, first, if you wanted to uh, support this project and get a lot of extra cool stuff, uh, I am posting uh, for, uh, for those who are patrons of 25 or over, I will be posting just the full text of Batavius. Um, so if you want that, you can get there. And then for all, all of my other patrons, I'll be posting um, the relevant sections from the author that we're going to be going over. So I have um, the I have a PDF of all of the sections of Epiphanius that we're going to be going over today. Uh, just so if you want to, uh, you can just read them, um, which everybody else, uh, if you're listening to this, you should uh, as a supplemental text. It'll take you like 15, 20 minutes. Just read the sections I'm going over. Um, because I will just be quoting like the snippets of where they actually talk about this. But if you just read the whole chapter, you can just easily see that I'm not taking it out of context or, or anything like that. And then, uh, if you happen, uh, to not be able to support in that way, uh, definitely uh, subscribe and send it to everyone, uh, that you would think would enjoy, uh, something like this, because I think this is important because everybody always asks me. Uh, over and over and over again to do stuff about the papacy or to do stuff about this or that or whatever. And uh, I really do think uh, while the papacy shirt uh, certainly is important, it's not really my thing. Uh, it's not really my thing at all. Um, uh, when it comes to skill set, I do think I can, uh, when it comes to Trinitarian theology and especially the Filioque way, uh, demonstrate the fact that the Orthodox church is, um, is certainly heretical. Uh, and certainly is condemned by the fathers, both Latin and Greek, condemned by sacred scripture, and then also uh, condemned by certain and sure theological reasoning. So uh, as sort of an intro of why we're starting in chapter three, because as you see, I'm starting in book seven, chapter three, section one. Why, why am I starting in chapter three? Why didn't I go over chapters one and two? Well, chapters one and two are of a purely historical nature. Uh, chapter one goes over the history of the controversy in general, and then chapter two goes over the history of the addition to the Filioque and to the Creed. Um, there's there's a lot of interesting stuff. Like you actually read that uh, there are uh, Frankish theologians such as uh, Radbertus, and Radbertus is actually uh, condemning the idea that the Filioque was added, uh, was original to the Creed, which you get. Uh, you get some Eastern Orthodox lying and basically saying that the Latins were so dumb during this era that none of them knew that the Filioque was added later. But uh, you, you see that this actually just isn't the case. Uh, well, there were certainly some people who said dumb stuff. I, I will I will not disagree with that. Um, uh, surely uh, they knew what they were talking about. So it's interesting from a historical perspective, but I didn't find it to be too useful uh, for the nature of the series. Maybe I'll do uh, some patron streams on those or something like that. But uh, if you are a patron, you can just get the text. So um, you can just read it for yourself rather than having to have me explain it for you. But chapter three in particular uh, covers 
uh, St. Epiphanius, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Cyril of Alexandria. And then it also discusses Didymus, but Didymus isn't technically a saint in the uh, Orthodox or well, Eastern Orthodox or uh, Roman Catholic uh, churches. So I, I didn't want to call him a saint. And uh, as a quick note, uh, and this is going to apply to the whole series, I will be using Greek where Patavius uses Greek. Um, I'm not an expert in Greek. Uh, but I did take about three years of Greek, so I know enough to follow an argument like Patavius is laying out here. So uh, don't get scared by it. Um, I will try my best to explain it for people who are not used to the Greek language. So in this uh, chapter three, or uh, really the, the rest of the whole patristic section, uh, he's he's going to say that the Latin fathers constantly use the language of the filioque. So basically, we just kind of have to answer the question of like, okay, which filioque? Uh, so that's going to be later in the section on the Latin fathers. And then uh, when it comes to the Greek fathers, uh, some of the Greek fathers uh, do use the language of and the son or from both or from the son or of the son or uh, whatever it may be, uh, and a number of other uh, different phrases that we can say are basically um, uh, the filioque uh, as a statement. Uh, we just kind of have to ask, like, okay, does the filioque uh, mean something which is a essential hypostatic um, existential uh, origin, hypostatic origin uh, from another person? Or uh, could it be like the orthodox say could it be an energetic manifestation could it be a temporal sending uh, could it merely be talking about consubstantiation um so really those are the questions we're going to have to ask and really uh, from context we're going to see every single time that none of the greek explanations are going to be up to snuff and it's really going to come through uh for you guys uh this is going to come through from actually reading the texts that i'm going to be going over um again none of these texts are super long uh, might be at most like 10 pages, 15 pages of material uh, to read through. Uh, it's not much at all. Um, so if you just check it out yourself, uh, if you're a serious Orthodox person or a serious Catholic who wants to research into this topic more, um, if you just read it yourself, you're going to see clearly that um, the Orthodox explanation is really just grasping for straws uh, at this point. So um, the patristic section is going to go over first the statements uh, of the Greek fathers and in this first explicit statements, because, again, there are explicit statements where they say from both, from the father, from the father and the son and so on. And then second, uh, we can look at what are called equivalent statements. So uh, to kind of explain the way in which uh, this works in uh, this is really in uh, logic or a theological method, rather. Uh, when it comes to the difference between an explicit statement and an equivalent statement, you can formally state the same thing in two different, uh, in multiple different ways. So uh, if I happen to say, uh, I didn't think, um, I didn't think of a, an example beforehand. Oh, if I happen to say, uh, I love Augustine and I love my son, Augustine and my son, uh, my son's name is Augustine, if you guys don't know. Augustine and my son, those are two different um, signs. Those are two different uh, phrases or words. But they have an equivalent reference. And that reference is to the person who I have uh, begotten. Uh, that is my firstborn child. So uh, the Greek fathers, in some cases, just explicitly say uh, filioque. And in other cases, well, obviously not filioque in, in Latin. Um, they, they say the uh, the language of the filioque, but in Greek. Uh, and then in other places, they say uh, basically equivalent statements to the filioque, uh, just in other words. So uh, in, second, uh, we're going to look at what the Greek responses are to all of the quotations that I'm going to be bringing forth. And then we're going to refute those. And then lastly, we're going to be looking at the Latin fathers. And then also, as an extension of this, the arguments that the Latins uh, brought forth uh, in the medieval uh, scholastic period. And then also, um, uh, at this, for example, like at Florence and at Second Leon, and then in the uh, Baroque era, which is going to be going up to the day of um, 
of Patavius, who Patavius died in the early 17th century, if I'm remembering the date correctly. So uh, this is why Franzlin is going to be so helpful uh, after this, uh, if I can go through Franzlin as well, because Franzlin is going to be dealing with this from a dogmatic point of view, and he's also dealing with this with a lot more resources than Patavius could have even dreamed of. It's fantastic. Okay, so continuing. So who was uh, St. Epiphanius? Who we're going to be going over. And notice notice that glorious uh, Latin picture of St. Epiphanius that I was able to find. I will try to, in spirit of discussing the Pilioque, not use Eastern icons uh, for all these figures. But uh, St. Epiphanius, he was a 4th century church father. He died uh, right into the dawn of the 5th century in 403 A.D., um, he was famous for writing the Panarion, uh, which is an important list of heresies from the early church. And he refuted them as well. And then the Encoratus, which he wrote in an, uh, earlier in his life, which refutes Arianism along with other uh, heresies. And uh, a cool fact about uh, St. Epiphanius is that according to St. Jerome, St. Epiphanius actually spoke five different languages. I think it was uh, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, uh, Egyptian, and Syriac. So he was uh, he, he he was very uh, well read uh, to say to say the least. So the reason that we're uh, we have him first and then also uh, the other three is because these uh, fathers are ones that actually just explicitly um, say from the song. They just explicitly say it. There's no other uh, way around it. That's what they say. And this is really going to be a question of, OK, uh, can we demonstrate uh, from the text, from the uh, language used, that this is speaking about substantial procession? That's going to be the only or Yeah, substantial procession. That's going to be the only question. So the reason that St. Epiphanius is coming first amongst the four is that he is actually just the clearest amongst the Greek fathers uh, when it comes to the filioque. So just read the Encoratus, uh, read the sections from the Panarion. Um, and uh, you can just clearly see. Uh, you, I don't even, you don't even really need me here to explain this one to you. This one's very clear. So, continuing. But Epiphanius was also an iconoclast. Cope. So with uh, Encaratus 67 and 71. So this is what is said. If Christ is believed to be from the Father, as God is from God, and the spirit is from Christ or from both, as Christ says, who proceeds from the Father, and this one will receive from what is mine, and Christ from the Holy Spirit, for uh, that which is her, the, the voice of the angel says, is from the Holy Spirit. I shall understand the mystery that delivers me by this faith, by hearing alone, by love for the one whom, who came for me. So this is actually the passage right here that convinced many of the Greek fathers um, council of Greek council fathers at Florence and second Leon. Uh, uh, Beccas um, brought forward this passage. Uh, Bessarion also uh, used this passage. So this passage uh, is one of the clearest uh, out of all of the passages that we're, we're ever going to cover. Because if you, if you just kind of go through this passage uh, on the face of things, it says that Christ is from the father as God from God. This is clearly talking about the begetting of the Son from the Father. This is clearly talking about some sort of um, hypostatic origination of Christ. And then uh, what you get in the next phrase, if you're not convinced of this, he says that the Spirit is from Christ or from both. So the Spirit's from the Father and the Son. You say, well, that could be this, that could be this. Well, look at, look at the, uh, the text that he cites. As Christ says, who proceeds from the Father. So in order to demonstrate that the Spirit is from both, he uses this passage, who proceeds from the Father. Now, this is the passage that the Orthodox say is the only uh, way in which we can uh, know from whence the Spirit proceeds. At least uh, classically, they're going to say that. So uh, if he's talking, if he's using this passage as a citation to prove the hypostatic origination of the Spirit from the Father, and then he says in the next uh, passage, and this one will receive from what is mine, uh, this is uh, Christ speaking about the spirit receiving from him, then how can you say that this is a non-hypostatic origination that's happening in the second phrase? It just makes no sense. This is just an outrageous reading of this passage to say that this is anything but Epiphanius saying that the spirit 
uh, proceeds from the sun as from uh, uh, his hypostatic origin. You see this again uh, from the first phrase, which compares it uh, to the uh, begetting of the son from the father, and then also from the proof, uh, one leg of which you must agree is the uh, the spirit proceeding from the father. Uh, so you you just have to affirm this. Um, and then this also affirms our reading of John 16, 14, uh, that the spirit will receive uh, from what is mine. So, um, and then we can also look in uh, a little bit more into the grammar and the uh and the parallel passages uh, from the Ankaratus. So the phrase uh, that is used is par emphoteron, emphoteron. Uh, again, I have Erasmian pronunciation, so if, if that sounds terrible to you and you know Greek, apologies. So uh, this is used a number of times actually uh, in his works. And uh, you can look at the preposition par or para, uh, is another form of this. Uh, par is just the uh, shortened form of para. Um, if you look at the preposition uh, par, uh, you can see that throughout the work, it is in reference to substantial uh, substantial origin. Uh, the immediate context, uh, when it looks at the beginning of the sun, the sun is from the Father, and God from God. And then you can also see uh, in another uh, section, this is two chapters later, but someone will say, therefore, we that uh, there are, we say that there are two sons, and how then is he only begotten? No, who are you speaking against God? For he, uh, if he, the Father, calls the one from him, son, again, from him, son, and the Holy Spirit, the one from both. Again, this is talking about from the Father and the Son. Again, immediate context is talking about the Father, uh, that the Son is from the Father as begetting. And the Holy Spirit is from both. Uh, there's really no way in which you're going to be able to read this in the Orthodox way. And then uh, he uses this phrase again, chapter 40. The Holy Spirit is from both, spirit from spirit. So when Epiphanius speaks of the Son being from him, the Father, he understands the origin and procession to be of the same essence. Uh, so he's using this to demonstrate that uh, the Son and the Father, that they're of the same essence, they're the, of the same um, usia. That's, what, that's what's being demonstrated uh, here. So it makes no sense of if uh, you're going to try to um, shoehorn some sort of temporal or energetic procession uh, into this. Likewise, when he speaks of the Holy Spirit being from both, it is evident from the chief passage that it should be understood in the same sense. Uh, again, this is just reading things in context. This is just reading things like any normal person would read any normal thing unless they had some sort of agenda to deny uh, what's being said. So continuing, uh, I think actually the more this is the more powerful section, and Quiratus, uh 7 through 9. If you just read through Ankaratu 7 through 9, uh, we, we literally see like, half a dozen or more uh, mentions. It's it's very, very frequent. You can see in context, the procession of the spirit from the son is being compared to the begetting of the uh, son from the father. It's being used to prove um, that they are of one substance and, and, and so on and so forth. So um, at the beginning of the work, uh, we have a very explicit um, instance. So the spirit of God both spirit of the father and spirit of the son is not according to some synthesis as soul and body are in us, but is in the midst of father and son from the father and the son third in naming. So notice here it's ek, it's ek uh, from out of just like uh, para is, is also uh, said to be from. So we notice there's different, um, there's different, I think I said, uh, prepositions earlier. I meant uh, par uh, particles. There's different particles um, which are being used um, throughout uh, the work. We're going to see also another one, which is X. So there's para, X, X. All of these different uh, are, um, uh, particles are going to be used throughout uh, this work by St. Epiphanius to describe the uh, dual origin of the Holy Spirit. So uh, if we compare other places where the particle is used, uh, definitely refers to substantial production and origin. 
Uh, for example, uh, when he states a little earlier that the son is Theon Ek Theu, that is God from God, he says the same about the Holy Spirit. Likewise, he affirms that the Son and the Spirit share the same divinity, Ek Tains Altains uh, Theotetas, sorry, from the same divinity. So notice Ek is just uh, talking about from the same divinity. Um, so again, uh, Ek, Ek, Ek. It's just, um, it's talking about substantial origin in all of the other instances. Why in this one instance would it not? Uh, he also affirms that the son is the true father, uh, true God from the uh, from the true God, according to the Nicene Creed. So he's going to uh, use the section from the Nicene Creed, uh, ek tus patras, uh, ek perumenon. So uh, he's just going to use ek in this sense, then right in the same sense, he's going to, uh, speak of the spirit as from the father with the same uh, preposition. So just just read the whole section. Uh, that that's the better thing. Just read the whole section. Uh, so also um, in Ankaratu seventy one to seventy two, and then the Panarion of uh, Heresy uh, seventy nine, he's going to state in that place as well. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, is the third light from the Father and the Son. And then again, therefore, if he proceeds from the Father and receives from me, as the Lord says, just as no one knows the Father except the Son, nor the Son except the Father, I dare to say that no one knows the Spirit except the Father and the Son, from whom he proceeds and from whom he receives. And no one knows the Son and the Father except the Holy Spirit, who truly glorifies, who teaches all things, who testifies about the Son, who is from the Father and from the Son. Notice this explicit language is just being used uh, in passing. And then um, in Panaron uh, 74, uh, this is heresy 74 in there, because remember, it's just a list of heresies. Uh, and then their refutation uh, by Epiphanius. He says, furthermore, the Holy Spirit is from both the Spirit from the Spirit, for God is Spirit. And again, therefore, if he proceeds from the Father and receives from me, as the Lord said, he who is from the Father and the Son. So uh, then the equivalence, uh, remember, uh, earlier we went over par m uh, foteron. That's from the both, basically from both. Here, he uh, gives the equivalence with X rather than par. And uh, it, indi it clearly indicates uh, that it expresses substantial procession and origin. Uh, again, we see it in every single uh, example of this preposition being used. And it's used uh, with reference uh, with the Son and the Father, Spirit and the Father. Um, it it's just very clear uh, what's going on. He's quoting the same biblical passages that the Orthodox are quoting them right next to it, saying that, yeah, the Spirit has the same relation to the Son as the Father uh, says in this passage, as the Spirit has to the Father in this passage. It's just, it's just very clear. And this is further uh, emphasized by the explanatory phrase uh, when he says Spirit from Spirit. Uh, he describes the Spirit as originating from the Spirit because God is Spirit, as Christ himself said. The Holy Spirit is from God because he is from the Father and the Son. Therefore, the prepositions para and ex uh, clearly signify procession and origin. So in the same heresy, he's going to say that the Spirit is from the Father and from the Son, where para is used. So notice, uh, this isn't as the Orthodox uh, sometimes would like you to believe, all I'm uh, emphasizing here, is there isn't just one like sort of special preposition or special phrase that any of these fathers are using. Uh, the Orthodox, what they'll do sometimes is they'll try to confuse you by saying, oh, well, this phrase actually means this. This phrase actually means this. He never uses this phrase for him, but he always uses that phrase for him. They do it for a number of different phrases, including like ek perumenon, uh, itia, and, and so on. But what you get here is you get a great, great diversity of prepositions uh, which are being used uh, in order to describe the uh, procession of the spirit from the sun. You get a great variety of them, and you see in context uh when you're looking through the, the context, and again, just read the chapter to see the context, um, you're, you're just seeing that uh, they're used uh, right alongside the begetting of the sun, 
these same phrases are being used to describe the procession of the spirit from the father. It's it's it couldn't be any more obvious is all that I'm saying. So then again, uh, in heresy uh, 62, uh, and this is going to be the last slide in heresy 62 against the Sabellians, he says he is not separate from the father and the son, but is from the same substance, from the same divinity, from the father and the son with the father and the son the Holy Spirit subsisting always. Okay, that's all that I have for you. Um, if you're interested in more material or to get the section from Patavius for yourself uh, or the reading for free that I posted up, uh, definitely consider becoming a patron. Uh, those who are uh, patrons of any amount can just get the uh, section from Epiphanius, uh, 25 and above for this section from uh, Patavius. So thank you, and as always, God bless.